Over the last seven months, I've created many videos and wrote many articles covering various topics on Code Geass. But oddly enough, I've only written two reviews for the original series, covering R1 and R2 respectfully. And those reviews were fairly basic and didn't go really deep into the series. Well, this video is finally going to change that. March is reviews month where I'm going to be reviewing as much of the Code Geass content that I can. That means Alusha the Rebellion R1 and R2, Aikido the Exiled, the new recap films which are part of the alternative universe, Alusha of the Resurrection, and Renya of the Darkness. And there is a reason why I'm not including Oz of the Reflection right now. And I think it makes sense to start the beginning with Code Geass, Alusha of the Rebellion R1. Now, this is not going to be a standard review. My assumption is that you have already seen Code Geass, probably multiple times at this point. So instead, I'm going to just discuss elements of the series in a freeform-like style. This includes parts I liked and parts I didn't. Before putting this video together, I've watched some of the most negative and positive discussions of the series, and part of my analysis has been influenced by those videos. And it's only fair to discuss both Kogias's strengths and weaknesses to do a thorough analysis. With that in mind, Let's jump into some Nightmare Frames, Command People to Die, and Destroy Britannia. Let's talk about Kogias, the Lush Other Rebellion, R1. I want to first start this off by going over the common complaints people have on R1. They are the Massacre of the Specially Administrative Zone of Japan, Mao, Suzaku, and Nina. The Massacre of the Specially Administrative Zone of Japan is one of the most controversial parts of the series. What seemed like a nice resolution to the series turned to tragedy as Alush loses control of his Gias at the worst time possible. And to top it off, he gave Yuffie probably the worst command possible given the situation. This leads to Yuffie killing the very Japanese people that she was trying to protect with the specially administrated zone. Critics have argued that this scene was contrived, that its only purpose was to get the plot going again, and there is some truth to this, because after this, Lush would declare the United States of Japan, and the Black Rebellion would begin. Now, was this completely contrived? No. We learned from Mal about the dangers of Gias, and how it can evolve to a point where the user can no longer control it. And Lush does make a promise with C2 that he would not allow the Gias to consume him, much like it did Mao. I'm not going to go too much into justifying what happened here. I recommend a video from Replay Value on this topic, but I bet most of you already watched it. In case you haven't, I will link it in the description below. The most important question here is, regardless if it's contrived, does this ruin the anime? And my answer is no, and here is why. It never bothered me from a plot point of view. It always disturbed me though, as it was a shocking part of the story from an emotional standpoint. One of the reasons why it bothered me so much was because I was so invested in what was going on, and it seemingly came out of nowhere. My reaction is a testament to how much I cared about the characters and the story, and I think the reason why some people discussed the contrivance of it is that they were emotionally affected by the event and did not like what happened, which is fair because I felt the same way. Despite this, I still understand the value of the scene. There are many things I would change in Kogias. This is not one of them. I mentioned Mao several times already, let's go to him next. Now I've gone on the record to state that Mao is one of the worst characters in Kogias, so keep that in mind while I defend him for a moment. The issue with Mao is not really so much with him, but with how the story utilizes him. He just shows up one day, decides to mess with Shirley, which results in Lush having to erase her memories, Lush faces Mao many times, and their conflict concludes with C2 killing him, and just like that, Mao is out of the story. And that's the problem. They used him as a tool to get Shirley out of the story, and to teach the audience some important things. And then the show acts like he never existed in the first place. I can only remember one time they referenced him again, and that's when Luce realized he has become like Mao after accidentally commanding Yuffie to kill the Japanese. As I mentioned previously, we do learn some important things because of Mao's part in the story. Those things are, Suzaku can outrun automatic gunfire. This is seen again in turn 25, when he is zero, during the Zero Requiem. Suzaku killed his father, which is why he's always putting himself in harm's way. The dangers of Gias, which I mentioned earlier, and we learn how Gias evolves. We get a little more insight into C2's background and learn about a previous contract. And most of all, Lelouch and C2 become close friends after the incident and possibly more. And these are the reasons why I think the character works in the story, but I just hate the way he was used in it. 
So I'm with people who hate Mao, but in the grand scheme, he does not ruin the story. And this might piss off some fans, but if we're speaking objectively here, besides what we learned from Mao, his only contribution to the plot was getting Shirley out of the story. And since Shirley is not that important to begin with, the lasting impact is not that significant. I know many of you are wondering about the whole, how did Mao survive part of the story, and I want to address that in another video. Also, if you're looking for a good analysis of Mao, I recommend this video from Kato. But now let's talk about possibly the most controversial character, Suzaku Kurarugi. Now I just spent almost 3 hours talking about Suzaku in an earlier video, so I'm not going to retread the same things. I will just keep this brief. Suzaku is very idealistic and sometimes a hypocrite early on in R1. But that does not mean that everything he says is 100% wrong, nor is everything that Lush says is 100% right. I never hated this character because he had some legitimate points and even shared Lelouch's goals. They both just had a different method to achieve those goals. He does his job well as being a good foil to Lelouch. Now I will admit there are several parts in the story where the writing just fails for Suzaku, and the worst being at the beginning of the anime. Suzaku first goes to stop the terrorists under the assumption they have poisonous gas. After he sees C2, he realizes that there is no poisonous gas, and even tells his superior this. Then, after he wakes up from his injuries, Lloyd tells Suzaku that the gas killed everyone, and Suzaku believes it. But then, when Suzaku is rescued by Zero, he tries to tell everyone that what Zero had did not contain poisonous gas. And it gets weirder because after the rescue, he asks Zero if he was going to use gas to harm the civilians. This constant switching could have just been solved if Suzaku does not believe Lloyd, or at least questions him, and never brings up the gas with Zero. Besides his poor writing, I had no issues with Suzaku. This was really more on the writers than Suzaku anyways. Now, with Nina, I've also defended her recently, so I will just say this. If you dislike this character, or hate the series because of her, take a look at why, and you might notice that some of the things that are bad about her are shared by more popular characters. Besides, of course, the infamous table scene. Now that I've gone over the common complaints, here are aspects of Kogias R1 that I did not like. Now, some of these are petty and probably nitpicky. The first is the dialogue. Most of it is acceptable. There are some exceptions, however. And these strange dialogue choices often took me out of the scene. For example, Jeremiah tells Colin in Stage 2, What kind of hunt is this if you just run away? My question here is, if the prey does not run away, how is it still a hunt? Or, how about what Cornelia says here? Don't follow unless you want to come along. I mean, yeah, that's obvious that someone who is following you is coming along. It's like saying don't put food in your mouth unless you're going to eat it. I'm just glad that most of the dialogue is actually very engaging. My next nitpick involves the art for Kogias. Sometimes characters look terrible, particularly the faces and the proportions. Characters can sometimes look way too thin with the most unrealistic limbs I've ever seen. And the faces sometimes look terrible with weird designs, particularly with the noses. This is something that they have corrected in the new scenes in the alternative universe and with Volusia of the Resurrection. Now, when the characters are drawn well, man is it gorgeous, and you can definitely see how R2 improved on this. Let's move on to something more legitimate, and that is Shirley's character. Forget about the possible plot holes or contrivances. The way Kogias handled Shirley is a tragedy. There was so much potential with this character, and it was ultimately wasted. Shirley's role in the story culminates in learning about Zero's identity through the death of her father and finally gaining the courage to ask Lelouch out. And how are these things resolved? By a simple mind wipe. I don't want to go further into the ramifications of this because then I'd have to discuss R2 and that's off topic. But the frustration here is that I never understood why they made Shirley if this was their plan for her. It seemed to me that they just wanted to write her off as if she was just in the way of the story. I have so many ideas about how they could have utilized the character better and I want to make a video about it in the future. And I do understand that Shirley does play a role in the story after the mind wipe, but it was limited and ultimately irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. And since we are on this topic, I was not a fan of how Valletta received the same treatment with memory loss, but at least in her case, things eventually worked out for her, which never happens to Shirley. 
Let's move on to my last gripe, the fan service. As I record this video, I'm almost 30 years old, so seeing high school girls in very suggestive situations is kind of awkward. And keep in mind that this is not a specific attack against Kogias, since other anime have similar fan service. And I tend to not like fan service in high school anime in general. To R1's credit, most of the fan service is tame and not too pervasive. And I also acknowledge that some of it has nothing to do with high school girls, rather the older women in the series. If you take the parts of Ashford out, then this problem for the most part is solved. And sometimes I will skip the Ashford parts when re-watching the series. Stage 19 and Stage 3 are particularly the worst examples of fan service in the series. The beginning of Stage 19, especially, is one of the worst parts in Kogias, period. When I first watched it, my immediate thoughts was, so they just got everyone on the island for... nudity? Okay. My thoughts on this remain the same, but I do understand why this episode exists, and there are nice things about it once you get past the fan service. Also, key in mind, not all fan service is bad, and I'm not against it in general. Rather, just how some of it was used in Code Geass. It was really unnecessary. And this is one of the reasons why I don't recommend it to everyone, because I know that some of my friends would get turned off by it. But I don't want to discuss any more of the negative aspects of R1, because I have so many positive elements to go over instead. Here is why I enjoyed Code Geass. Let's first start with the premise. It's very interesting. What I like is how the story has elements from both the standards hero's journey and Dan Harmon's hero circle. Lelouch starts out as someone who has three major goals. Find out who killed his mother, destroy Britannia, and most importantly create a gentle world for Nunley to live in. But he can't enact change because he needs power. During one of his normal gambling exploits, something happens and after a near car crash, Lelouch is dragged into a terrorist attack, which leads him to getting Gias. And at this point, he passes the point of no return, and this is something C2 points out later as well, thus starting his journey to accomplish his goals. What's nice about Kogias is that you learn in a few minutes who the enemy is, what our main protagonist's goals are, and what to expect going forward. Hate this show all you want, but even the harshest critics have to admit that Kogias does a great job of setting up this story in a quick and efficient manner. As I just mentioned, this story is about siblings trying to survive in this harsh world. I love stories like that, which is why Monster and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood are some of my favorite anime. It's a very relatable situation, and it immediately gives you a reason to root for Lelouch, even if some of his actions are questionable, to say the least. Something that does not get discussed as much, but should, are C2's narrations before each episode. Rather than just do a simple recap like so many other shows, we instead hear different things from C2 before each episode. These include things like philosophy, explanation about the world in Kogias, a general summary of the series, and other nice tidbits of information. Kogias is very good at explaining on a general level what's going on in the series, and these monologues from C2 are one of the ways the story does this. It also helps solidify things in the series, in case you're still confused about some stuff. Another way Kogias explains to the audience what's happening is through media. We're talking newspapers, computers, and of course, television. It never felt contrived since that's how people tend to learn about things. And I like how it was even an important part of some of Zero's schemes, since those plans involved Zero putting on a performance in addition to his actual main goal. In fact, some of the best moments in Kogias are witnessed on television. My two favorite being the announcement of the Black Knights in Stage 8, and Charles' infamous speech in Stage 6 during Clovis's funeral. And this contributes to the impressive world building in Kogias. Some of it's explained to the audience, and other parts can be inferred from conversations, certain events, and again through the media. I also like the general setting of Kogias in a post-war Japan, where they have been stripped of everything and just another area in the Britannia Empire. Now, while the initial war between Britannia and Japan is over with this so-called peace, there is still conflict throughout Japan, and you get a sense that this country could turn back into a battlefield at any time. And that's exactly what happens in this story. And it's one of the reasons why you can never get too comfortable in this universe. Beyond Lucius' struggles to destroy Britannia, we get parts in the story that discuss politics and philosophy. Usually, Lelouch and C2 are the ones discussing these topics. It seems like every time Lelouch faces off with someone, he will usually say, let me ask you a question. And you know an important philosophical question is coming. But we also get some great conversations involving Detard. There are three interesting conversations between him and the Black Knights on politics and philosophy in Stage 18, Stage 19, and Stage 22. 
And those are some of the best conversations in the series. It just shows that there's more going on here than just some high school kid trying to take down a whole empire. And speaking of taking down a whole empire, Lelouch realizes that he is going to need an army to defeat Britannia, hence the formation of the Black Knights. The Black Knights' evolution in the series is quite phenomenal. It starts out as a simple terrorist group turned into an army, so-called Knights of Justice. Lelouch understands that creation requires destruction and needs to wipe out the old terrorist resistance groups since their ways are old and outdated. This leads to the Black Knights becoming the most dominant force that opposes Britannia in Japan. And the Black Knights, as a result, grow into this massive organization. They get support by both India and the House of Kyoto. They get awesome nightmare frames, including the Gurren Mark II. Because so many members join the Black Knights, Luch has to create a whole organizational structure just to keep everything in order. And to top it all off, they get the power of the Four Holy Swords and even a submarine. And this evolution of the Black Knights is what helps the audience believe that they could actually defeat Britannia. Since I just mentioned the Nightmare Frames, let's talk about that. The Nightmare Frames are an interesting part of the series, often overlooked as just something added to the story, just so we can have mechas. But there's a lot going on with the Nightmare Frames that I think is more than that. One of the reasons why they are in the story in the first place is because Britannia defeated Japan using them. And these Nightmare Frames, like Britannia's other advanced technology, are powered by Sakuradite, which is one of Japan's most important resources. That trade dispute is what caused the war in the first place. Let's go into the Nightmare Frames themselves. Each one has more of a grounded look, something similar to the armed slaves from Full Metal Panic. I like the simplicity of how each one operates. There is a passcode and a USB key to access a given Nightmare Frame. With the more complex generations, you might also get a keyboard that requires a specific combination for different actions. And the handles are movable, allowing for complex arm and leg movements and improves the overall maneuverability. How they operate is very intuitive. I especially like how in stage two, we observe the different buttons used for communication. One for communicating for people outside of a nightmare frame, and one for communicating between nightmare frames. And different models and generations have different monitor systems that improve as new models come out. The main distinguishing features when it comes to nightmare frames are the slash Harkins, Factosphere sensor, the roller blade-like design for movement, and the bulky cockpits, which adds some realism to designs, and how those cockpit designs differ between the Japanese and the Britannians' nightmare frames. And if you pay attention, you also learn about the Blaze Luminous System, the Hadra Cannon, and the Radiant Wave Surger. Just nice little details where the show integrates you with the techno lingo, but not to an extent that it would overwhelm or confuse the audience. It's something we naturally learn about as the series progresses. The Nightmare Frame combat itself is fast-paced, usually comprising a combination of hand-to-hand combat and classic shootouts. And the show's choreography for these battles is amazing, and it makes every battle enjoyable to watch. The most intense hand-to-hand Nightmare Frame combat is when the Lancelot and the Gurren Mark II battle each other. Looking beyond the combat, my favorite part of the Nightmare Frames is the evolution of them throughout the different generations. This is really more prevalent in R2, but we do see it in R1 as well. As the series progresses, both the Black Knights and the Britannian forces are throwing out newer, advanced Nightmare Frames, and each one is more awesome than the previous. It's also exciting to see what these Nightmare Frames can do. I could keep going on about the Nightmare Frames for a while now, but I think I'll save that for another video. But now I want to discuss the characters. So obviously you have a ton of characters, which includes Lelouch, Suzaku, C2, Colin, Shirley, Ogi, Cornelius, Schneizo, Toto, Jeremiah, Valletta, Rakshada, Lloyd, Cecile, and so many others. And I can definitely feel for those who think that there might be too many characters in this story. Even I had to go through the series a couple of times just to remember everyone's names. But the amount never bothered me because I was able to memorize the main cast with no issue. Now I'm not going to discuss any of the characters at any great lengths in this video because it's already long enough. So instead, here's an overview. I enjoyed all the characters in the series minus a few individuals. Seeing the different factions in the series interact are some of the best moments in the series, with some interacting with multiple factions, including Lelouch, Colin, and Suzaku. Not every character goes through the same level of growth as the main cast, but I felt everyone gets a chance to shine in the series and at least have their moment, and in some cases more than one. I also felt that everyone on some level was important to the story, 
even surely until the mind wipe. For example, all the original members of the Black Knights are still important even when the organization grows because they need to train the new people. They also give their thoughts on the current situation in later episodes. With a show that has so many characters, having everyone relevant on some level is an achievement to itself. With characters comes relationships and Kogias has so many. We learn about the past camaraderie between different characters, both implicitly and explicitly, from many scenes. This helps us understand both sides in the war and can make us appreciate why each one is fighting. I like how even the strongest characters show weakness and emotion when they need to protect those closest to them. It adds realism to the story and really demonstrates how much the characters care for one another. There are even parts where certain characters are hurt by others and can only passively aggressively express it to them. One of the reasons why certain scenes are so shocking in Kogias is because we care about these characters, and not just them, but the groups of people they hang out with. It's another element of the story that I feel gets overlooked, and it's something that I pay more attention to with each subsequent rewatch. Now here are even more reasons why I like Kogias Lucian Rebellion R1. Both the sound and the music in Kogias are fantastic. There are many catchy scores for different scenes. My favorite include The Black Knights, Picarsku, Strange Girl, Stories, and of course my favorite, All Hail Britannia. The soundtrack is epic and also includes the openings and endings. Although I personally never liked the second opening song, but I really enjoyed the first and the third. The third intro though had lazy visuals when compared to the other two, but that song was amazing. The voice acting is phenomenal, both for English dub and sub. I mean, here's the all-star team that provided voices for the English dub. Laura Bailey, Travis Willingham, Steve Blum, Troy Baker, Kate Hickens, Crispin Freeman, Jameson Price, and of course, Johnny Young Bosch. And that's just listing the A-list stars. There are even excellent voice performances for the minor characters as well. Lloyd and Cecile's actors are great. It was an excellent casting choice. Despite some of the designs for the characters not always looking the best, the animation overall for Kogia still looks great and holds up fairly well for a series that's over 10 years old. And the way technology advances 10 years, that's basically ancient. The Nightmare Frames are well detailed as well as the set piece backgrounds. They also have these artistic pictures at the end of each episode with drawings of the main characters. I especially like how they combine with clips towards the end of the season. This series still boasts very impressive scale in some of the conflicts. One of my favorites is the Black Rebellion at the end. I mean, look at this shot of Alush piloting the Gaywin while the entire army is behind him. So awesome. Also, the Zero Suit design today still remains awesome and iconic making Lelouch almost like anime Batman, as Code Men once joked about. But most of all, this season was such an awesome experience that made me go through a roller coaster of emotions, and by the time it was done, all I could do was just remain silent and take it all in. Despite all I've discussed in this video, I feel like there is still more that I could say about the series, and that's a testament to how great it is. But I'm going to end it here. If there was anything you wanted me to go further into, let me know in the comments section below. Hey, if you want to know where to go next for awesome Kogi Ass content, I recommend checking out my blog or checking out other videos on this channel. This month is going to have the release of the new direction I want to take my anime and streaming guide in, so it's something you're not going to want to miss. But with that out of the way, what is your favorite aspect of Kogi Ass R1? Did you like my points or disagree? Either way, let me know in the comments. Please like and share this video if you enjoyed it. And remember, the world is not a dark place, and tomorrow will be a good day. Thanks for watching.